Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. I do apologize if my voice sounds a little bit croaky in this video. I think it sounds okay, but I've been ill with a cold and a sore throat for the last week or so and it's only just starting to part with me now so yeah if my voice sounds a bit worse for wear that is why but this week we are going to be talking about the case of Margaret Fox a teenage girl from New Jersey who just mysteriously disappeared one day in the mid 1970s Margaret left her home all excited and looking forward to starting a new job her first ever job but things took a very dark turn when she never returned and of course panic set in for her family, especially when they received contact from an individual who claimed to be holding Margaret hostage. But despite an extensive police investigation involving the FBI, Margaret has never been seen again since that day. And nearly five decades later, her case remains unsolved. So you guys know the drill, as always with the unsolved cases that I cover, there will be some contact details to law enforcement, linked down below in the description box in case anyone watching this video has any information about Margaret's case. So for this week's case we are going back more than 49 years now to the summer of 1974 in Burlington which is a city located in the state of New Jersey in the US and this is Margaret Ellen Fox. She was a 14 year old girl who was born and raised in Burlington. Margaret who often went by Maggie was born on the 4th of February 1960 to parents David and Mary Fox and she was one of six children. According to sources she was the second oldest of the kids and she was the only girl. All five of her siblings were boys so I can imagine that it must have been very loud and chaotic at times in the Fox household but overall it would appear as though Margaret had a good childhood. She was very close to her family. She would of course have the occasional fight and bicker with her siblings but she was said to be able to hold her own with her brothers and they would also have a lot of fun together too. Apparently the family would often enjoy going to the beach together when it was hot in the summer. In the winter months they would go ice skating and sledding in the snow. They would just do fun family activities like that. It really does appear as though they were quite a tight-knit bunch. Just quickly before I continue, I think my neighbour has just started mowing his lawn. Can you hear that in the background? I do apologise if you can hear that in the video. Margaret was described by people in her life as being a very bright and smart and caring young girl. She was said to be very determined and chatty. Her hobbies included things like horse riding and playing the piano. She actually took piano lessons. She was a student at the St Paul's Catholic Grammar School in Burlington. She was in the eighth grade. Although it's stated on a few sources that unfortunately Margaret did experience a bit of teasing and bullying at school sometimes which she would often write about in her diary. She would write about how kids would constantly like throw snowballs at her but not like in a jokey playful way in quite a mean and aggressive way and just do not very nice stuff like that to her. However just a couple of weeks before this case occurred she had actually graduated from St Paul's Grammar School and I think school ended for the summer so she was finally free from all of that and my Margaret had plans for her time off school. She decided that she wanted to use this free time that she now had to try and earn some of her own money. Because, you know, she was a teenage girl, so she wanted to be able to start going on shopping trips and buying her own clothes and probably makeup to go out with her friends and her siblings. And so she wanted to get a little job to fund all of that. And I feel like 14 is quite a standard age to get your first job, isn't it? I had my first job at 14. And what job do men any teenage girls start off with babysitting. Margaret and her cousin Lynn, who I believe was just a little bit younger than Margaret, they decided to start babysitting together and they planned to put an ad in the local Burlington newspaper advertising their services as babysitters. Although it's been said that Margaret's parents, David and Mary, didn't really feel very comfortable with their daughter doing this. They were very protective of their children, probably particularly Margaret because she was their only girl. So they 
they were a bit apprehensive about her releasing this ad and having people, having strangers contact their daughter. But apparently Margaret just kept trying to persuade them to let her because as I said, she really wanted to earn a bit of pocket money. She wanted to be that bit more grown up and independent. And so I think rather reluctantly, they finally agreed to let her put this advertisement in the local paper and it read, quote, babysitters experienced teen girls love kids work at your house and then Margaret and Lynn's telephone numbers were at the end for people to call and it wasn't long before someone reached out to Margaret apparently just the day after she published this ad she was contacted it was the 19th of June 1974 when Margaret received a telephone call regarding her services as a babysitter she was contacted by a man who said that his name was John Marshall and actually it turns out that this John Marshall had contacted Margaret's cousin Lynn first. He firstly rang Lynn's telephone number and inquired about her babysitting his son. However, when Lynn asked her mother if she could do it, if she could babysit for this man, her mother said no, she didn't feel comfortable with her daughter doing that. I think mainly because the man said that he lived in an area called Mount Holly in New Jersey, which is just over seven miles away from Burlington. And apparently Lynn's mother felt that that was too far. I think if Lynn was so eager to start babysitting, her mum would have preferred it if she babysat for people more local in their area rather than travelling to Mount Holly. And so because her mum said no, Lynn passed on her cousin Margaret's number to this John Marshall and said that Margaret might be able to do it. And so as I said, on the 19th of June 1974, Margaret received a call from John Marshall. He informed Margaret that he was looking for a babysitter for his son who was just five years years old. He obviously said that he lived in a house in Mount Holly and he said that they had this big backyard with a swing set and even a swimming pool. He wanted someone who would be able to work four hours a day, five days a week and he was offering Margaret $40 a week. Plus he agreed to pay any bus fares because she would have to get the bus to Mount Holly if she accepted this job. And Margaret was very excited about this opportunity, very excited about the prospect of earning $40 a week and so she was pleading with her parents to please let her do it and I think again her parents were a little bit apprehensive about agreeing however Margaret's father David decided to speak to this John Marshall on the phone himself about the job and he seemed like a nice normal man there was nothing about this telephone conversation with John Marshall which raised any alarm bells and so David and Mary Fox agreed and they allowed their daughter to accept this babysitting job now in Initially, John Marshall had asked Margaret if she could start work in just two days time, which would have been the 21st of June 1974. However, he later rang the Fox family home again and claimed that because of a sudden family emergency, they would have to postpone. And so it was eventually agreed that Margaret would start on the 24th of June instead. So the 24th of June rolled around, Margaret woke up that morning, probably with a spring in her step, looking forward to the day ahead. She got herself all ready. She was wearing these flared jeans, which were a maroon colour with a yellow patch on one knee, some brown sandals with a strap around the heel, a long sleeved light blue floral blouse, and also a black and white checkered coat. She was also wearing some jewellery, which included a gold necklace with flowers on it and a blue stone, a gold bracelet, again with a blue stone. She had some glasses, which had gold wire frames. They were a hexagon shape, and they had broken off nose and and temple pieces. She also had with her a Huckleberry Hound design glasses case and a brown bag and possibly a swimming costume too. Of course all of that information is important to relay because this case is still unsolved so it's important that we know exactly what Margaret was wearing that day and the items that she had in her possession. So anyway she woke up that morning, got dressed, left her home and headed off to the bus stop in Burlington because she had previously agreed on the phone with her new employer John Marshall that she would get the bus to Mount Holly and that either he or his wife would meet her at an intersection in an area called Mill and High Streets once she arrived and then they would go in his car, his red Volkswagen, to his house where she would begin babysitting. And apparently John Marshall had also agreed with Margaret and her parents that again either he or his wife would drop Margaret home later that day. So Margaret walked to the bus stop. One of her brothers, Joseph, actually walked her 
to the bus stop. She got on the bus at around 8.40 a.m., said goodbye to her brother, and off she went. But as it would turn out, that was actually the last time that anyone in the Fox family ever saw Margaret because she never came home after this and they never heard from her again. Prior to leaving for her babysitting job that day, Margaret had promised her parents, David and Mary, that she would call them as soon as she arrived at John Marshall's house to obviously let them know that she was okay and that she had gotten there safely. However, this call never came. They never received any contact from their daughter. So of course they immediately started to worry. As we know, they were already a little bit uneasy about this whole situation, and now that Margaret hadn't gotten in touch, they just started to panic. Now, before Margaret left the house that morning, she had actually, like, scribbled down on some bits of paper a couple of details about this babysitting job for her parents. So she wrote down, obviously, that her new employer's name was John Marshall. She wrote that she would be home by around 2.30pm, and she also wrote down John Marshall number. And so when the call from Margaret never came, her mother Mary picked up the phone and she rang Marshall's number. And when someone answered, she asked if her daughter Margaret Fox was there, could she speak to her? And according to sources, the person on the other end of the line just said, no, sorry, there's no Margaret here. And so confused, Mary called this same number again, because perhaps she had just misdialed it or something. However, this time when someone picked up, she was actually informed that she had been calling a payphone. This number was from a public telephone which was outside of an A&P supermarket on Route 38 in Mount Holly. So of course this just added to the confusion and panic. Something clearly was not right here. And so Margaret's father David immediately decided to go out, go to Mount Holly, I believe with a friend of his, and they decided to just search around the area for Margaret. Meanwhile as he was doing that, Mary was getting in contact with all of her daughter's friends and other family members just asking if perhaps Margaret was with any of them but of course she wasn't. Sources state that upon hearing of Margaret Fox's disappearance neighbours of the Fox family offered their help and they started going out and searching for Margaret too but they had no luck. They were searching pretty much all day and all into the evening and they never found Margaret and so later that night David David and Mary Fox decided that it was time to call the police and report their daughter as missing. So the Burlington Police Department began investigating her case and I think it was immediately clear to them, given the circumstances, that this was very serious. This was not a case of a child running away from home or anything. The evidence seemed to indicate that Margaret had probably been abducted because of the fact that this John Marshall had clearly given her a fake phone number to give to her parents. As we know, the number was traced to a payphone. So yeah, it was obvious that this was probably a kidnapping that the police had on their hands. And so to begin their investigation, they decided to retrace Margaret's steps, retrace the route that she would have taken to get to Mount Holly that morning. And luckily, during this line of inquiry, they did identify some witnesses who claimed to have seen Margaret that day, or a girl matching Margaret's description. There were two two passengers who were on the same bus as Margaret that morning and who told the police that they recalled seeing her. One of these passengers was a woman and she was on the bus with her young son. Apparently they were sat behind Margaret on the bus and at some point during the journey her son actually pulled Margaret's hair and so Margaret turned around. She obviously wasn't annoyed that this boy had pulled her hair because he was very little and so she just started chatting with him and his mother and this woman later described described Margaret to the police as seeming very happy and having, quote, smiley eyes. And she also told the police that Margaret got off of the bus at a stop in Mill and High Streets in Mount Holly, as expected, as agreed with John Marshall. And she was seen by another witness who informed the police that after Margaret got off the bus, they saw her talking to a man. He looked as though he was around his 
early 20s and he was in a red coloured sports car. Now I did read on one source that this man in the red car was eventually traced and identified by the police but they were able to determine that he was innocent. He had nothing to do with Margaret's disappearance. So it's believed that Margaret was seen speaking to him because she was trying to work out if he was John Marshall as John Marshall had told Margaret that he would pick her up in his red Volkswagen car. And this sighting of Margaret speaking to the guy in the car was the last. She has never been seen again since this sighting. Those were really the only sightings of her from that morning. The police tried to find some more witnesses. They took a picture of Margaret and they showed it to residents in Mount Holly and showed it to people in shops asking if anyone had seen her. But apart from those two accounts that we've just talked about, it seemed as though no one had seen her. But news of Margaret's disappearance spread relatively quickly. It wasn't long before her case was being reported on in the news and in newspapers. And what's terrifying is that as news spread, several members of the public, several parents of teenage children, teenage daughters came forward stating that a similar thing had happened to them. That a stranger had tried to enlist their child as a babysitter, tried to recruit them for a babysitting job, which apparently turned out to be fake. So was the man that had clearly lured Margaret to a fake babysitting job, this John Marshall, the same guy who had tried to employ these other girls. It's definitely very possible. I mean, it's clear from everything that happened in the lead up to Margaret's disappearance that this crime was premeditated. This was very carefully planned. So had he been trying to kidnap a young girl for a while when he was finally successful when he reached out to Margaret? Just a couple of days into the investigation, the FBI actually became involved in the case and they started doing everything that they could to try and work out who John Marshall was. So they started looking into all of the men in the area and surrounding areas who had this name and they interviewed them. Apparently there was even one guy that the police identified who was either named John Marshall or Jack Marshall. Different sources seem to say different things. But he became a person of interest in the case because it turns out that he actually worked in the AMP supermarket in Mount Holly where the payphone was. The payphone that the calls made to Margaret in the lead up to her disappearance were traced to. So yeah, he became kind of a suspect in the case, although eventually he was ruled out as having anything to do with Margaret's abduction, as were all the other John Marshalls, to be honest so it was pretty clear to the police that John Marshall was made up. It was most likely a fake name used by the perpetrator. Of course, he's not going to use his real name. In addition to this line of inquiry, the police also began looking into everyone in the area who had a red Volkswagen to try and determine whether any of the owners could have been responsible, but unfortunately, this again seemed to lead nowhere. But in the hopes of securing some more leads to look into, a dedicated tip line was set up just for tips relating to Margaret's case and the police received so so many. They received so many calls from members of the public with potential lead. Many said that they knew of individuals named John Marshall that might be worth looking into. Many would just call saying oh the perpetrator could be this person or it could be that person. They even received reported sightings of Margaret from other states and cities. Apparently there was one potential sighting of her in Texas, another in Chicago, but tragically every single tip and lead and sighting seemed to be just resulting in dead ends for the police and every single person of interest and suspect that they looked at they could more or less rule out. They could never find concrete evidence linking them to the crime. A couple of months after Margaret's disappearance the authorities did release a composite sketch of a man that they wanted to speak to in connection with her case. He was described as being white between the ages of 35 to 40, blue eyes, very white teeth apparently, and with light blonde or ginger slash reddish hair which was starting to turn grey. Now confusingly, I'm actually not sure why exactly the police wanted to speak to this man, what relevance they thought he may have had to the case. One source seems to suggest that he apparently drove a red Volkswagen, the same kind of car that John Marshall told Margaret he had, and that he was 
seen trying to pick up young girls, teenage girls in the Mount Holly area in the lead up to Margaret's disappearance. So I suppose that's why the police were very keen to speak with him. But as I said, I only read that on one source. And as I understand it, the man in this composite sketch has never been identified to this day. Now, as I briefly mentioned before, despite the fact that the police strongly believed Margaret wasn't a runaway, I think this theory was still looked into slightly, mainly because of the fact that if you recall from earlier on in the video, I mentioned that Margaret had unfortunately encountered some bullying in school. There were a couple of kids who just weren't very nice to her and she would write about all of this in her diary, write about the bullying that she had endured. And when the police read through her diaries, they discovered that as well as this, Margaret had also written about wanting to move away, to start a new life, how she wanted to move to either California or Florida. So the police did consider the possibility that maybe she had actually done that. She'd chosen to run away to escape the bullying that she was experiencing at her school in New Jersey. However, of course, no one really believes that that was the case, including the police. Yes, Margaret had written these diary entries about leaving, but she was 14 years old. What teenager hasn't had those kinds of meltdowns where they've said, I'm leaving, I'm moving away. I know I definitely did when I was that age. Of course, you don't actually mean it. And I'm sure neither did Margaret. And obviously all of the evidence in this case just did not support the runaway theory at all. The evidence suggested that she had been tricked and kidnapped by someone. But exactly who that person was, the police had no idea. And tragically, days without Margaret turned to weeks, weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. And there was still no sign of her anywhere. But her family never gave up the search for her. Margaret's father, David, in particular, never gave up looking for his daughter. Every single day, he would be out searching for her. And a lot of the time, his sons, Margaret's brothers, would join him. They would, I think, mainly focus their search on the Mount Holly area, obviously. David would print a load of pictures and missing posters of his daughter and he would hand them out to people asking strangers if they had seen his little girl. He would place Margaret's pictures on the windows of his car. He would speak to the media. I have a quote here from David. This is something that he said to one of the media outlets that he spoke to. Quote, I can't imagine what has happened to her. A child her age. We are heartbroken. This is a tough apple to swallow. She's a nice girl. Really don't like to brag but she is a wonderful person. David and his wife Mary, the whole Fox family really, just seemed to dedicate their life to finding out what happened to their beloved Margaret but to no avail. Although, just the year after she vanished, in late 1975, there seemed to be possibly a huge development in Margaret's case as that was when someone actually confessed to her abduction and murder. It was in November of 1975 when an inmate at the Montgomery County Jail in Pennsylvania, his name was Charles Clobridge, he made contact with the authorities, the police, because he said that he had something he needed to tell them. Charles was currently in jail after being arrested for larceny. However, he was about to confess to a far more evil and sinister crime. He sat down with the detectives and he told them that he was the one responsible for the disappearance of Margaret Fox, which had obviously happened about a year and five months prior. Charles told the police that on that fateful day, the 24th of June, 1974, he picked Margaret up in Mount Holly and he took her to the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York and he said that it was there where he killed her. He claimed that he strangled Margaret to death and then he actually threw her body off of a cliff. And so believing that finally they had their killer and they had answers as to what happened to Margaret, the police began a search of the mountains. They had a helicopter search the area from above. They had officers search on foot. But they even brought Charles to the mountains himself and had him pick out the area where he said he had thrown Margaret off of the cliff. However, despite all their efforts, they never found Margaret. And I think it was then when detectives
detectives started to question whether or not Charles Clobridge was actually telling the truth and quickly they realised that he wasn't. I believe they confronted him after they couldn't find Margaret's remains in the mountains and it was then when he tried to change his story entirely. He said something like, oh actually no she's not in the mountains, she's buried in some landfills in Burlington County, which of course she wasn't, this was another lie. And in fact when the police looked further into Charles Clobridge they actually discovered that on the day that Margaret went missing he was a patient in a hospital in New Jersey. So he couldn't have been her killer or abductor. His confession was false. This was all a huge hoax. And when he was later asked why he had done this, why he had lied and sent detectives off on this wild goose chase, he apparently just said, quote, honestly, I can't answer that. I can only imagine how devastating this whole ordeal must have been for Margaret's family to think that finally, after nearly a year and a half, they might actually have answers only to then be told that it was a hoax, just one huge lie. It must have been awful for them. In addition to Charles Clobridge, a couple of years after Margaret vanished, another guy was looked into as possibly being her kidnapper. It was a sex offender who, at the time of her disappearance, apparently lived pretty close to the bus stop in Mount Holly where she was last seen. And as well as that, he also owned a red Volkswagen. So he was considered a suspect, but again, ultimately, upon looking into his movements on the day in question, the police realised that it couldn't have been him. It could prove through a logbook that he was working that day in June of 1974. And tragically, as time went on, the police began to receive less and less tips and leads, and they just had nothing to go on really. They were no closer to identifying John Marshall or finding out what happened to Margaret a couple of years in than they were on day one. They didn't even know if she was still alive. The case was just at a standstill. It had gone cold and for years, for decades actually, there was no news, no developments. Or at least that was until 2019, 45 years after this case occurred, when the Burlington Police Department, along alongside the FBI dropped a bombshell, they released a groundbreaking piece of evidence to the public that they had withheld up until this point. Now, Margaret's case was effectively reopened a couple of years before this in 2017 by a retired former police detective named Michael D'Alessio. He planned to review the case, go over all of the evidence, and his hope was to obviously finally solve the mystery of of her disappearance and bring closure to her surviving family members. But it was in 2019 when the Burlington Police Department held a press conference, I think either on or around the 45th anniversary of Margaret's disappearance. And as I said, they released a pretty huge piece of evidence. They released an audio recording of a phone call that had been made to the Fox family very shortly after Margaret went missing back in 1974. So basically, just to give some extra context here, very soon after Margaret's disappearance, the authorities decided that it might be beneficial to record all of the calls that the Fox family received out of their house, just on the off chance that they might receive contact from the individual who was responsible for Margaret's disappearance. And unbelievably, it seemed as though they did. Now this happened either just the day after Margaret went missing or four days after on the 28th of June. Again, confusingly, different sources seem to say different things on that. But sometime shortly after, the Fox family received a phone call from an unknown male demanding $10,000 from David and Mary Fox in exchange for their daughter's life. This was a ransom call. Now, the reason why the audio of this phone call was not released until 2019 was apparently because it wasn't clear enough until then. They had to use new technology to enhance the clip and I'm going to play it for you now. $10,000 might be a lot of bread but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread but your daughter's life is the butter topic. 
Who is it? And at the end of the clip there, that is Margaret's mother, Mary, asking who is this? And just the day after this call was made, the Fox family also received a letter at their address, which basically just said the same thing. It read, quote, $10,000 is a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. And apparently the letter also read, Margaret is all right. We only tore her blouse and broke her glasses. Follow the instructions. And the instructions were to put the cash, the $10,000, in a box with blue wrapping. They apparently wanted blue because it matched the colour of the blouse that Margaret was wearing. And then I believe the letter said to basically just await further contact and further instructions on what to do next. However, these further instructions never arrived. The family were, of course, prepared to do whatever the person on the phone call and the writer of the letter had said. And they got the money together as quickly as they could and waited to hear back on how they could deliver it in order to get their daughter home safe. But they never received any information about the next steps. And in fact, just a couple of days after the first letter was sent, another letter arrived at the home. And this letter basically read that it was too late. The deal was off because Margaret was dead. It read, $10,000 was a lot of bread, but your daughter's life was the buttered topping. Of course, as soon as these letters came through, the police began trying to determine who they had come from, who sent them. And something that they noticed was that both letters were signed off with the words, so long again. With each first letter of each word capitalised, so S-L-A were all capitalised, and this led the police to theorise that perhaps SLA stood for the Sibonese Liberation Army, a terror group who were active in California in the 1970s and who were responsible for the kidnapping of a 19-year-old girl named Patty Hearst. Patty was abducted just a couple of months before Margaret's disappearance in February of 1974 and she was indoctrinated. She was made to agree with and follow their ideas and beliefs. The organisation intended to essentially use Patty as part of a negotiation tactic in order to free some of the SLA members from jail. They essentially said, give us back our members, let them out of prison and Patty will be freed. So as I said, it was theorised when Margaret went missing, when the Fox family received these letters, that perhaps the SLA were responsible for her abduction too, because the letters were signed so long again. Although, as I understand it, this theory was eventually ruled out. I think the police looked into it and they were able to determine that the Sibonese Liberation Army was not involved in this particular case. Now, these letters were examined by the FBI and they were able to obtain latent fingerprints from them, which were entered onto several federal databases. However, unfortunately at the time, no match came back. And what is so, so frustrating is that these fingerprints are lost now. They're missing. They've somehow gone lost in storage at some point over the years. So even if there was a match on databases today, well, the police will never know because they've been misplaced. Which, yeah, like I said, is so disappointing because if they hadn't gone missing, then who knows, perhaps this case would be solved by now. Perhaps the person responsible for Margaret's disappearance would have been identified. But I mean, that's if the ransom phone call and the ransom letters did in fact come from the perpetrator. Of course, there's always the possibility that they could have been a hoax. From what I can gather, by the time the call came in and the ransom letters were sent, Margaret's case had already hit the headlines. It had started to be reported on in the newspapers. So maybe the caller and the letter writer was just some um, twisted individual who wasn't actually involved in her disappearance but they had read her story in the news and they just wanted to torment the family as part of some kind of sick joke. Cause the family even more pain by pretending that they were Margaret's abductor and I guess giving them hope, potentially false hope, that Margaret was still alive. To this day we don't know for sure whether the call or the letters were real or fake but of course as I mentioned in 2019 the 
recording of the ransom call was released to the public during a press conference held by Burlington City Police. The police were hopeful that even though it had been 45 years since Margaret vanished, maybe releasing this call would finally provide the breakthrough that they needed. Maybe someone would recognise the caller's voice and come forward with their name. And according to one source, despite how much time had passed, they did receive hundreds of new tips and leads off of the back of this. But of course, that was a couple of years ago now, and this case is still unsolved. So I suppose we can assume that these tips resulted in mainly dead ends. Unless, of course, the police are still working their way through them now, who knows? As well as the audio of the ransom call, the police also released an age progression photo of what Margaret may look like now if she is still alive. I think there are two age progressions, actually. One of Margaret around 49 years old and the other around 56. And in addition to that, the FBI have also put forward a $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the person or people responsible for Margaret's disappearance. The police have been able to rule Margaret out as being several Jane Doe's. And yeah, it seems as though this case is still actively being looked into today. So fingers crossed the police will have a breakthrough soon and Margaret's family will finally have answers. Tragically, her parents, David and Mary, have both passed away. But I think at least a couple, if not all of her siblings, are still alive. And they, of course, are still waiting for closure. So hopefully they will receive that in their lifetime. It's just horrific that it's been nearly five decades now and they still don't know exactly what happened to Margaret that fateful day. They don't know who that John Marshall was and they don't even know if Margaret is still alive and out there somewhere or if she was killed. As I said at the start, if anyone watching this video has any information regarding the disappearance of Margaret Fox, then the relevant contact details to the authorities will be linked down below in the description box. I know from my YouTube demographics that a lot of you guys watching may not have actually been around at the time that this case occurred, as I wasn't, but I think it's well worth maybe sharing this video or sharing Margaret's case with people in your family who were around at the time. With your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, particularly if they lived in New Jersey, because you never know. Sometimes with these cold cases, it literally just takes one person, the right person coming forward with information that could break the case wide open. But that concludes this case. That is the unsolved case of Margaret Fox. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments down below. Do you think that the ransom call and the letters were fake or do you think that they were sent by the actual perpetrator, by John Marshall? Definitely let me know and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Channel. They can be solved cases, unsolved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.